Good afternoon. We are so glad you're here for Stories from Childhood. This is a very special concert combining stories and books with music performances. There are four world premieres on this virtual concert. Our fantastic artist faculty from the conservatory are bringing this music to you from Simon Concert Hall here at OCM. We invite you to share your stories and memories with us. Go to omahacm.org slash stories and check out the story prompts to share your unique stories. After the concert, these performances will be available for you to watch again and again and to share with your friends and family near or far. A special thank you to Debbie and Speedy Zweibach. Their generous support made this program possible. Now, we're starting the concert with The Story of Ferdinand. Once upon a time in Spain, there was a little bull, and his name was Ferdinand. the other little bulls he lived with would run and jump and butt their heads together, but not Ferdinand. to sit just quietly and smell the flowers. He had a favorite spot out in the pasture under a cork tree. It was his favorite tree and he would sit in its shade all day and smell the flowers. Sometimes his mother, who was a cow, would worry about him. She was afraid he would be lonesome all by himself. Why don't you run and play with the other bulls and skip and butt your head, she would say. But Ferdinand would shake his head. I like it better here, where I can sit just quietly and smell the flowers. His mother saw that he was not lonesome, and because she was an understanding mother, even though she was a cow, she let him just sit there and be happy.
As the years went by, Ferdinand grew and grew until he was very big and strong. All the other bulls who had grown up with him in the same pasture would fight each other all day. They would butt each other and stick each other with their horns. What they wanted most of all was to be picked to fight at the bullfights in Madrid. But not Ferdinand. He still liked to sit just quietly under the cork tree and smell the flowers. One day, five men came in very funny hats to pick the biggest, fastest, roughest bull to fight in the bullfights in Madrid. All the other bulls ran around, snorting and butting, leaping and jumping, so the men would think that they were very, very strong and fierce, and pick them. Ferdinand knew that they wouldn't pick him, and he didn't care, so he went out to his favorite cork tree to sit down. Ferdinand didn't look where he was sitting. And instead of sitting on the nice, cool grass in the shade, he sat on a bumblebee. Well, if you were a bumblebee and a bull sat on you, what would you do? You would sting him. And that is just what this bee did to Ferdinand. Wow, did it hurt! Ferdinand jumped up with a snort. He ran around, puffing and snorting, butting and pawing the ground as if he were crazy. The five men saw him and they all shouted with joy. Here was the largest and fiercest bull of all, just the one for the bullfights in Madrid. So they took him away for the bullfight day in a cart. What a day it was. Flags were flying, bands were playing, and all the lovely ladies had flowers in their hair.
They had a parade into the bull ring. First came the banderilleros with long, sharp pins with ribbons on the end to stick the bull and make him mad. Next came the picadores, who rode skinny horses, and they had long spears to stick in the bull and make him madder. Then came the matador, the proudest of all. He thought he was very handsome and bowed to the ladies. He had a red cape and a sword and was supposed to stick the bull last of all. Then came the bull. And you know who that was, don't you? It was Ferdinand. They called him Ferdinand the Fierce. And all the banderilleros were afraid of him. And the picadores were afraid of him. And the matador was scared stiff. Ferdinand ran to the middle of the ring and everyone shouted and clapped because they thought he was going to fight fiercely and butt and snort and stick his horns around. But not Ferdinand. When he got to the middle of the ring, he saw the flowers in all the lovely ladies' hair and just sat down quietly and smelled. He wouldn't fight and be fierce. No matter what they did, he just sat and smelled. Banderilleros were mad, and the picadores were madder, and the matador was so mad he cried because he couldn't show off with his cape and sword. <laughs> So they had to take Ferdinand home. And for all I know, he is sitting there still under his favorite cork tree, smelling the flowers just quietly. He is very happy. My name is Stacy Borellos and I'm the composer of Big Al. Big Al is a piece for soprano and string quartet and it's about a fish who's having a hard time making friends. Part of the reason he's having a hard time is because he's kind of scary looking. But the other thing is that the other fish aren't really listening to him 
And this is something we can all work harder at doing, at listening to each other. Have you ever been talking to someone and you can tell that the other person is not really listening to you? Or have you ever been talking to someone and you're not really listening to them, but you're thinking about something else? Especially now when we don't see as many people or we have to work extra hard to listen on a computer or on a phone or some sort of device. So I think it would be great, myself included, if we would all try harder to listen to each other. And I hope that you enjoy this concert and this piece, Big L. But big 
The Ugly Duckling. Once upon a time, in a fairy tale place where anything can happen, Dolores Duck was sitting on her eggs, waiting for them to hatch. them looked normal, the fifth looked like a jelly bean. But as mothers do, Dolores loved them all the same until they hatched. The first four, Carl, Carla, Carlotta, and Carlito, were perfectly downy yellow ducklings. But the one from the jelly bean? Mm, not so much. Agatha Louise was flat and covered with fur the color of coffee. She had four squatty legs, clawed webbed feet, and a chocolatey, leathery, ping-pong paddle-shaped tail with an almost duckly bill to match, but not a wing or a quack to her name. And when Dolores did roll call, Carl, quack! Carla, quack! Carlotta, quack. Carlito, quack. Agatha Louise, <coughs> Agatha Louise, <coughs> Agatha Louise, is that any way to talk to your mother? Oh, but mother, cried Agatha Louise, <coughs> is how I talk. It is also how you get a time out, young lady, the young duckling, young whatever you are. <laughs> Looks like an ugly duckling to me, whispered Carl to his brother and sisters, who laughed and laughed. <laughs> Agatha Louise pretended not to hear as she watched her siblings strut to the pond, bob for their breakfast, and splash about. I can swim too, she shouted, but no one paid any attention. Something is not right here, 
she thought tearfully to herself. And what's not right is me. That night, when all the ducks were balanced on one leg, fast asleep, Agatha Louise snuck away. She walked for hours, her short little legs propelling her through tall marsh grasses until she heard a splashing sound. She poked her head through the reeds, <laughs> and saw an animal swimming joyfully among her children. If I join you, asked Agatha Louise. Oh, please do, the sleek furred mother responded. I think this lake is big enough for one more. <laughs> My name is Agatha Louise, and you are... Oh, I'm Etta the Otter, said the adult female. And these little cutie pups are Sammy, Pammy, and Tammy. Hey, come on in and play, yelled Pammy. Agatha Louise scuttled into the lake. From under the water, she saw that their bodies were just like hers. Oh, maybe I'm an otter, Agatha Louise thought happily, playing duck, duck, goose with her newfound friends. she said aloud. I used to think I was a duck. What is a duck, wondered Tammy. It's a bird with feathers and wings and webbed feet that can swim in a lake or fly in the sky, Etta replied. But instead of a mouth like yours, Agatha Louise added, it has a bill like mine. All the otter pups crowded around to take a closer look. Whoa, Sammy said, and then Tammy spotted her tail. Oh, what on earth is that, she asked, shying away. Well, don't you each have a tail, queried Agatha Louise. Not like that, she said. We're otters with tails that match our bodies. My tail matches my beak, said Agatha Louise proudly. Maybe I'm just a different brand of otter. Yeah, smirked Sammy, an ugly one. As the sun began to set, each of the otters dove into the lake to find its supper and then used its tummy as a table to feast on what it found. Meanwhile, Agatha Louise scooped up yummies from the bottom with her bill, and as she reached the surface, she started to chew. <laughs> Sammy. That's not the way we otters do it. I suggest you mind your own business, said Etta, and let our guest eat the way she likes. Sammy, Pammy, and Tammy grudgingly did as they were told. But they weren't happy about it. And they certainly weren't happy with Agatha Louise. Something is not right here, she said to herself, 
and I believe that something is me. So that night, when the otters were soundly sleeping in their den, she scurried away. I must belong somewhere, she wept as her little non-otter legs skidded her from the shore to the forest floor. After walking for what felt like forever, she heard a huge cracking sound and scooted out of the way just as a giant leafy tree, boom, hit the earth right where she had been standing. Kid, you all forgot to yell timber, a strangely bucktoothed critter shouted to a pair of smaller versions of herself as she ran to Agatha Louise's side. checking to see if Agatha Louise had been injured. Are you okay? I think so, trembled Agatha Louise. Wow, did you look out, one of the younger creatures cried. That tree almost smoothed your beautiful tail. You don't think my tail is ugly? Agatha Louise was astonished. How could he, said his sister when we have ones just like it. The two youngsters compared their trailing appendage to hers and found them to be the same, as were their fur a number of feet. Oh, where are our manners, children? asked the mother to her kids. We are the beavers, she proclaimed. I'm Beverly, and these are Theodore and Bucky Sue. Pleased to make your acquaintance, said Bucky Sue politely. Yes, agreed Theodore, looking at their guest inquiringly. So who and what are you? Oh, I'm Agatha Louise. I'm not a duck or an otter, but I love to swim underwater. <gasps> so do we, grinned Beverly. Everyone, follow me. She led the three youngsters to the river, and they all waded in their squeals of laughter singing in Agatha Louise's ears. Maybe I'm a beaver, she thought happily. Closer to the horizon, Beverly gathered her brood plus one for dinner around the stump of that newly fallen tree. Okay, kids, let's eat, she commanded, and her kids joined her in gnawing at the broken branches with their pointy front teeth. Come on, Agatha Louise, invited Bucky Sue. These are delicious. But poor Agatha Louise could not get even the smallest branch past her bill, and besides, she had no pointy teeth to chew it. You are just plain weird, whispered Bucky Sue. Theodore nodded, and ugly too, he added, as Agatha Louise trundled back to the lake to bottom feed alone. Something
something is not right here, she said to herself, and I believe that something is me. And so Agatha Louise slunk off again, her heart broken in two. by the time she stopped to eat. As she soaked them in a river, she saw a familiar reflection staring back at her. The closer she moved toward it, the more like her own it appeared to be. Suddenly, it emerged from the water and Agatha Louise was beak to beak with a larger version of herself. It said, <laughs> she responded. Agatha Louise, it asked her. <gasps> Mom, Agatha Louise responded. The two snuggled together, crrring and swimming and eating and just catching up until finally, Agatha Louise asked her mother the one question she had been trying to answer her whole little life. What am I? Oh, my darling child, her mother laughed, her eyes filled with love. You are a platypus just like me. A whatapus? asked Agatha Louise. A platypus, her mom explained, which a lot of other animals may think are weird and ugly, remembered Agatha Louise sadly. But that doesn't mean it's true. Agatha Louise was shocked. It doesn't? True to them, maybe, the grown-up platypus continued. But to another platypus, there is no animal more beautiful. Oh, gee, does, does that mean you think I am beautiful? I, Patty Platypus, think you, Agatha Louise Platypus, are the most beautiful creature I have ever seen. Not counting Agatha Marie Platypus, Agatha Elizabeth Platypus, and Davy Crockett Platypus. Oh, I have sisters and a brother too? Patty smiled and nodded. Let's turn around and head for home. I cannot wait for you all to meet each other and be a family at last. As these furry birds of a feather scampered homeward together, Agatha Louise learned that she had been egg-napped by a water rat who tried to swallow her whole. Luckily, the rat couldn't open his mouth wide enough so he left her in the first nest he found. And the rest of this story we already know. Except for the last part, where Agatha Marie, Agatha Elizabeth, and Davy Crockett all welcomed home their long-lost platypus sister and loved her so much that she started loving herself too. 
Something is right here, she said proudly, and I believe that something is me. <laughs> Tale place where anything can happen, Agatha Louise and her duck built, otter body, beaver tailed family lived happily and platypusfully ever after. <laughs> Unicorn and dog books. Singing. My mom reading to me. It's a tie between my mom reading me a book and, and spending two minutes with my mom. To read books. Reading with dad. Mom reading with me. Praying. Getting all my PJs.
when I was a little boy, <clears throat> my brother and I were being babysat by a neighbor boy. I was probably five, my brother was seven, and our babysitter was probably 12. And he wanted us to go to bed. And he said, the first one in his pajamas, I'm gonna call Speedy. So I raced into the bedroom and put on my pajamas. And so that's been kind of my moniker ever since. My colleagues all knew me as Dr. Speedy and I've been speedy ever since, but it was a very benign beginning. And then, then I got into road running and I was a reasonably accomplished road runner. And that's when they took his name away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a porcupine. Mr. and Mrs. Porcupine had their first child, they were delighted. Should they call him Needle Rooser? Needle Rooser? No. Needle Rooser was too long. Prickles. Pokey. Together, they had an idea. Let's call him Fluffy. It's such a pretty name. Fluffy. But soon there came a time when Fluffy began to doubt that he was Fluffy. He first became suspicious when he backed into a door and stuck fast. Oh, that was not a Fluffy thing to do. He was even more convinced when he accidentally slept on his back and poked holes in the mattress. Oh, a very unfluffy thing to do. When he tried to carry an umbrella, he knew the truth without a doubt. Fluffy definitely wasn't. So he decided to become fluffier. Clouds are fluffy, he thought. I'll be a cloud. But he couldn't stay up. Pillow 
pillows are fluffy, he said. I will be a pillow. But when his mother sat on him, she was not pleased. He tried soaking in a bubble bath for 45 minutes, but he did not become fluffy. He became soggy. He tried whipped cream. He put a little on each quill, but it was not easy, and it took more than half a day. But this did not make Fluffy fluffy. Oh, they should have named me Gooey, he sighed. He ate a lot of fluffy marshmallows. He rolled in shaving cream and feathers. He even tried to become a bunny. But the truth remained. Fluffy wasn't. One afternoon, Fluffy set out for a walk, trying to think of ways to become Fluffy. Before long, he met a very large rhino. the rhinoceros. I'm going to give you a rough time. <laughs> Fluffy didn't know what a rough time was, but he didn't like the sound of it at all. What is your name, small prickly thing? asked the rhinoceros unkindly. said Fluffy. The rhinoceros smiled. <laughs> he giggled. <laughs> then he <laughs> laughed out loud. <laughs> he rolled on the ground. <laughs> he jiggled and slapped his knees. <laughs> Fluffy was embarrassed, but he tried to be polite. What is your name, he inquired. <laughs> I can't say it, giggled the rhinoceros. Mm, Huber, suggested Fluffy. <laughs> oh, help! I just can't say it. I'm laughing so hard, said the rhinoceros. Um, Harold? Or maybe Herman? No, gasped the rhinoceros. It's <laughs> Hippo! Hippo? A rhinoceros named Hippo? Fluffy smiled. 
He giggled. <laughs> then he laughed out loud. <laughs> A porcupine named Fluffy. A rhinoceros named Hippo. It was almost more than they could bear. Hippo and Fluffy rolled on the ground, giggling and laughing until tears came to their eyes. From that time on, they were the best of friends. And Fluffy didn't mind being Fluffy anymore. Even though he wasn't. I hope you've been enjoying all of these great stories and the beautiful music that goes with them. As we come to our last story, I want to thank Debbie and Speedy Zweibach again for making this program possible and our series sponsors, Omaha Steaks. Don't forget to go to our website and share your special stories using the prompts we have there. And our last story happens to be one of my very favorite. It's Gordon the Goat. Gordon the Goat was my favorite book when I was younger, and you can see it's very well loved. It's out of print, so the pages you'll be seeing are from this book. And I loved Gordon. I would introduce myself as Gordon um, when I was little because Gordon had to learn that he needed to make his own good choices. No matter what everybody around him was doing, he needed to think for himself. So I hope you enjoy Gordon the Goat.
Gordon was a goat. And he lived in Texas. Gordon liked to eat. He didn't care what he ate. He would try anything. Most of the time he ate leaves from the mesquite tree. But he would just soon try a dish towel or a delicious ham, if he could get it. And every now and then, Gordon would bite a cactus. But he was sorry every time he did. Gordon lived on a ranch with a lot of other goats. He didn't work very hard. All Gordon did was go on being Gordon day after day. And now and then, he would get his hair cut. The men who cut his hair called it mohair. They sold it to other people. The people used the mohair to make cloth and to stuff cushions. That was all right with Gordon. He didn't care what the men did with his hair, just so they didn't nick him while they were cutting it off. Some of the other goats on the ranch were called lead goats. They were called lead goats because the other goats followed them around. Whenever a lead goat got tired of staying in one place, he'd go to another place, and all the other goats would tag along behind him. Sometimes a new place was better than the old place, Sometimes it was worse, for better or worse. For better or worse, when the lead goat went, the rest of the goats went along. Now, Gordon went too. He didn't know why. He just did what all the rest of the goats did. He didn't think about it too much. But it took Gordon so long to get going, all the other goats were ahead of him. Gordon was always at the tail end of the line. One hot day, the lead goat got tired of staying where he was, so he set out to find another place. He remembered seeing some new weeds on the other side of a hill. After a long, hot walk, the goats found the new weeds. The weeds were not very good, and soon Gordon did not feel very well. He was sorry he had come along at all. Gordon sat down on the side of the hill. He made up his mind to stay there until he felt better. But just when Gordon was getting comfortable, the lead goat set off for another place. Away he went, and the other goats followed him. The very last goat was Gordon, who really didn't feel like going at all. Gordon walked and walked. The hot sun beat down on him. And Gordon began to wonder, why had he come along? Why didn't he do some thinking for himself? Why did he follow all the other goats who were following the lead goat? Just because that's what they always did? It didn't make sense to Gordon. All of a sudden, Gordon saw something way off ahead of all the other goats. It was a big, dark, dusty looking thing and it was coming right at him. 
It begun at the ground, and it went clear up to the sky. It was the biggest thing Gordon had ever seen. The thing was coming at him faster and faster. Gordon wished the lead goat would turn around and go somewhere else. But the lead goat went on walking straight ahead. And so all the other goats went walking straight ahead too. The thing was coming at him until all the goats were right in the middle of it. It was a twister. Now a twister is no fun to be in it. Gordon was scared. Up he flew in a black cloud. It tossed him around and around. It tossed him upside down and downside up. Now Gordon was real sorry he had ever eaten those new weeds. First he turned yellow, then he turned green, and then he was sick. Gordon felt sorry for himself. He had never felt so sorry for himself before. When he thought he just couldn't last much longer, he saw the old lead goat go spinning past him. The old goat went higher and higher. He looked as if he felt worse than Gordon. Just then, Gordon was thrown from the twister. He landed with a thud in the middle of a field. The field was soft enough to keep him from breaking all his bones, but it was hard enough to hurt a lot. After a long time, Gordon got up. He was stiff and sore, and he ached all over. But Gordon knew something now that he would never forget. Never again would he follow along just because everyone else did. He was gonna find out first where he was going, why he was going, and what he was going to do when he got there. Gordon does his own thinking now. He gets along much better than before. What 